to discuss the Social Partnership and Public Procurement Wales Bill. My name is Carolyn Jones. I'm the Director of the Institute of Employment Rights and I'll be chairing this event tonight. I'm pleased to see the event has attracted such interest with nearly 100 people registered. So thanks for joining us, everybody. And while I'm thanking people, can I thank my two colleagues, James Harrison and Sarah Glenister, who are busy behind the scenes making everything work efficiently. Because of the numbers, we have restricted screenshots to the speakers, uh, which allows us to video the event without interruption. Feel free to place your questions to the panel uh, using the question button below and keep your eye on the chat box for links to additional materials. Tonight, we have just over an hour and we have an excellent platform of speakers who will each have just 10 minutes each to share their thoughts on the bill. As you will know, the Social Partnership Bill is currently out for consultation with a closing date of the 23rd of April for submissions. The aim of tonight, therefore, is to highlight the opportunities presented by the draft legislation and to encourage and hopefully inform the debate around the consultation process. For some time now, IER has been working with the Wales TUC and with uh, Mick Antonew around the work of the Fair Work Commission. In July 2019, we held a joint public meeting in Cardiff to highlight the similarities between the policy proposals in our Manifesto for Labour Law and the Wales Fair Work Agenda. Indeed, <clears throat> excuse me, that same year, IER contributed to the Fair Work Commission's review into employment standards by submitting our Manifesto Law drafted in 2016. We are proud of that work and we are just as proud to be here with you again tonight. IER will be submitting a response to the consultation, so our discussion here will be helpful in that process. Hopefully we can learn from each other. At IER we have been, excuse me, um, uh, impressed by how Wales has used its devolved powers to navigate its own path around important legal, social and economic policies. So whether it was retaining the Agricultural Wages Board or resisting as much of the Trade Union Act of 2016 as your powers would allow, or your decision to pay care workers their full pay when forced into isolation. On all counts, Wales has helped highlight how things can be done differently if the political will and determination exists. And this bill continues that fine tradition by raising the bar on two important issues. First, the role trade unions could and should play in secure and an efficient and effective economy, an economy that gives workers a voice in the important issues affecting their lives. And second, the need to ensure that government procurement practices are open, transparent, and most importantly, used as a lever to promote good employment standards across the economy. And when we say standards, we don't mean the standards set by politicians in London. You have no doubt been following how Westminster's procurement methods have been tested in the courts and been shown to have failed on that test. We mean standards that recognise the role of trade unions and reward only those companies and bodies willing to work with the trade union movement and promote fair employment practices. At IER, we have been promoting the voice of workers and the role of unions for over 32 years. So we are proud to continue that tradition and work with you here today. So on to our speakers. Um, our first speaker tonight will be Hannah Blythen. Um, Hannah is from Flintshire in North East Wales and was elected as a member of the Senate for Dellen for the first time at the 2016 Assembly elections. I first came across Hannah way back in 2014 when she wrote a blog piece for us on a Supreme Court decision allowing the creation of an agricultural advisory panel when the UK abandoned the last of our wages boards. At that point, Hannah was a trade unionist in Unite before progressing to Senate. So Hannah, you have a long history of involvement in promoting social partnership in Wales. Update us on more recent developments and the current consultation. Over to you, Hannah. 
Thanks, Carolyn, and thanks for that introduction. And I think first thing I should say, you know, so I, I'm not that I was a trade unionist. I am a trade unionist, and I always will be a trade unionist, and I always be central to everything I do, both in the Senate and, and and in government. And I just want to start by saying, actually, you know, thank you for hosting this tonight. I very much appreciate the opportunity not just to share platforms with some excellent uh, speakers, but also to like you say, have an opportunity to shine a spotlight on some of the work we're trying to do in Wales within the powers that we have to really push the fair work agenda and make a difference to people in work. And I'm, I'm very much looking forward to hearing those contributions from the panel, seeing how we can shape that work moving forward, but also any questions and suggestions from people watching the, the session as well. Uh, and like you said, you know, I, I come from a trade union background and, um, you know, Mick is, is on the session today and I, I fought many of the same battles with Mick, especially around the agriculture agricultural advisory panel which you mentioned and I think it was that work for me um trying to shape that policy and taking forward that social partnership agenda within Wales in the trade union movement which actually made me think about standing for the Senate in the first place and that you know if this is what we could try and do from the outside imagine what I could do from the inside so now I find myself in the in the, the different position of actually being there in terms of and, and different challenges and actually how we take forward um this piece of you know will work as the potential to be a very significant piece of of legislation with the draft social partnership um public procurement but I think you touched on actually you know how you know social partnership really is it's, I think you said it's become like a, a way of working, a Welsh way of working and how we do it. Um, so first and foremost, this, this bill is about putting that on a statutory formal footing with a statutory social partnership council. But if I may, you about, you know, the way we've done things in Wales and the different approaches. And I think that's never been brought into sharper focus than in the past 12 months as we've worked together in partnership in the, in the face of the coronavirus pandemic. And you know, not only is it, it, it really shown, shown uh, brought to the fore those entrenched inequalities that still exist in workplaces across the country, but actually the real value of social partnership and not just the structures and being able to come together in a shadow social partnership council or the, the recently you know, the established in the autumn, the um, health and safety forum to look at those areas that aren't devolved, but try and bring partners together to make a difference in those areas and drive change in Wales. It really has actually, it's not just about the structures, but it's actually seen as being able to shape things and and bringing greater protections perhaps in the workplace in Wales than we've seen elsewhere across the UK. And there's also been times when you know, particular trade union partners have come back with feedback and then things haven't been working the way it should be. And then that's been taken on board and we work together to, to, to improve things and take things take things forward. So I think you know there's never been a more important time to really cement and take forward and, and solidify the work we've been doing in working in social partnership in Wales. So Social Partnership Council in the bill will set up a tripartite structure giving an equal seat around the table to advise government for government trade unions and employers. I think you know you touched on the kind of limitations of where our powers are in Wales and I'm very much looking forward to this discussion tonight about actually how we can you know how we can really push that to make a real difference. Um, so actually it's how we use all those levers at our devolved disposal to 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 do this this legislation to not just to, to improve work but to put, improve public services and all about bringing that broader benefit um that, was, that brings for for not just our not just for people in work but for our communities and our economy and our on our country um if I may just I know I know we've got limited time tonight but if I just touch on some key areas of the bill and then perhaps we can I know others will touch on it as well following on from me so. Um, so as well as the Social Partnership Council, there will be a social partnership duty on certain public bodies, as is set out in the consultation and the bill at the moment it is those bodies which are currently covered by Section 6 of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, but the consultation does that, you know, does it assist the appropriate list, should there be others, is there anything missing? And that duty will place a duty on those partners to work in social partnership and with recognised trade unions where they, where they exist. I think it goes back to actually, you know, what we said before, that we you know, we may not have responsibility over employment rights or industrial relations in Wales. I think mean, that you know, where that goes in the future might be subject of a whole other uh, discussion and debate for IER. But um, I think you know, it's about actually how we use those powers that we can to make the diff to make the best we can possibly do. So through the power of the public purse, which is why the public procurement element of this legislation is so important in terms of actually how we can take forward our fair work gender and to to secure better better outcomes in terms of work practices and strengthen socially responsible procurement um, the new duties around socially responsible procurement and con there'll be sorry there'll be new duties around socially responsible procurement and contract management and um, 
it's maybe this is a slight the, the more techie bit but i'll try and go over it as quickly as i possibly can and obviously there'll be opportunities um in the chat as well and if there's any follow-up afters i'm more than happy to to send that information over to share with, with partners and, and colleagues as well um so the, the procurement duties will include an overarching duty on a contracting authority to seek to improve the social, economic, environmental and cultural well-being of its area by carrying out public procurement in a socially responsible way, which ultimately means taking action to contribute to achieving the well-being goals and fair work goal, and together which they're taking together the socially responsible procurement goals. Um, we'd expect as this a contracting authority to also set and publish objectives designed to maximise its contribution to achieving that socially responsible procurement goals. Um, the contracting authorities will be required to publish procurement strategies and a register of current contracts, and in scope organisation is also required to produce annual reports which will cover the procurement activity over the previous year. Um, two separate contract management duties um, will be included in the draft bill. And they're designed to create greater due diligence around um, socially applying socially responsible um, contract terms through supply chains. Um, uh, so there'll be Walsh ministers will be required to publish model social public works clauses designed to bring about improve the improvements of economic, social, environmental, and cultural well-being. The consultation sets out that this duty in the first instance will be looked to apply to the construction sector because we know through uh, <laughs> through our experience that that's the sector where we know there's a significant challenges in terms of trying to address um, unfair and unlawful employment practice, but it'd be by no means limited to that, that sector in, in, in the long term. An exception notification to Welsh ministers will be required in advance of the advisement of, sorry, the advertisement of any contract if the body does not intend to apply and monitor the application of the contract clauses and alongside the model term statutory guidance will include details of the processes that should be put in place to monitor and manage those and then the other contract management duty um, will be in addition to the reporting process for the workforce or as we more commonly know it the two-tier code of practice um, so the bill will provide a statutory basis to the code of code of practice and those contract clauses in the draft bill um, will be referred to as social public work, workforce clauses and Welsh ministers would be required to publish model clauses. Um, any contract, and as before, an authority would be required to notify the Welsh ministers if having considered whether to include public workforce clauses and outsourcing services contract intends not to do so. Um, and over the course of this, this evening, and I'm sure Shivana and Mick and others will mention it about actually um, the role for um, compliance and enforcement. And if anybody looks through the, the draft bill at the moment, you'll see that's not included on the face of the draft bill. And one of the challenges we found in terms of setting this out is time frame and, and, and where we were in terms of the pressures of the pandemic. So what we want to do is actually as part of the consultation is actually you start as you mean to, as, as you continue as we begun in working in partnership to see how we can strengthen the bill in those areas, the consultation does act, not just should there be enforcement or compliance, but actually what would they look like? How would they work in practice? And you know, I think people would very much welcome any contributions this evening uh, around that. And the other element is the fair work duty on Welsh ministers and the fair work objective. And I know Mick's gonna probably touch on that a bit more in his contribution, but I'm happy to perhaps come back a bit more detail on that in, 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 in the questions. I think, I'm aware I've talked for quite a while already, so I think I'll, I'll conclude by coming back to kind of where, where where the draft bill started and building on that practice of social partnership working that we already have in place in Wales. And, and this particular draft bill um, originated initially in the now First Minister's leadership manifesto. And I think the initial plan was to legislate for a social partnership council through a social partnership act in this Senate term. Um, obviously the pressures are where we are with the pandemic and, and likewise meant that hasn't been possible but I really want to place on record that you know we've all only been able to get to this point with the draft bill and actually building it to make it the draft social partnership and public procurement bill because of the efforts of all of our social partners and particularly those in the trade union movement to get us to this point and it very much is um, you know I think there's very much an opportunity there and as in tonight to continue in that spirit of collectivism and working in partnership to strengthen the bill and actually you know that the parts that we touched on in terms of actually really um which are really challenging in terms of our competency and so how far we can go to actually make a difference in work within those powers that we have in Wales and how we use them not just to to create you know to strengthen this bill to to create the best legislation but to actually do it in a way that creates the best change when it comes to people's lives as well. 
Brilliant. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that, Hannah. Um, that was well timed as well. That was just up your 10 minutes. So very well um, organised that contribution. Thanks for the introductory overview remarks uh, and the issues for consideration. Um, I know you had to speed through it. So there is a link in the chat box to the bill uh, and to the consultation process. So anybody who hasn't yet engaged with the consultation, please do. Uh, you finished up there talking about working with the trade unions and the role that unions have played in developing this agenda. So that takes me very neatly on to our next speaker, who is Shavana. Hi, Shavana. Shav Taj is the General Secretary of the Wales TUC. She took up that position when her predecessor, Martin Mansfield, went to work with the Fair Work Commission, I believe. Um, before her current role, Shav worked for the PCS Trade Union. And Shav will be giving us the trade union response to the bill and how people can engage with the consultation process. So stage is yours, Shav. Thanks, Carolyn. And thanks to um, Hannah for kind of setting the scene. So I think that it's important for me to kind of begin with uh, a little bit like what Hannah said, that the COVID has really provided us with a good example of how social partnership can work in action. And it's important that, you know, uh, that I say that it's been both good but equally challenging at times as well. And one good example of social partnership working in Wales um, and how quickly it has accelerated work on uh, reform specifically for care workers uh, via the Social Care Fair Work Forum that was set up. And, and this period in particular gave us an opportunity to get that moving really quickly. We also, as Hannah has pointed out, you know, we already have a particular way of working that we refer to as the Welsh way of working. And that really gives us a regular opportunity to directly um, engage with the First Minister and other ministers as well on a heap of pressing issues as well. So we meet on a fortnightly basis. And it's thanks to this type of working that we have been able to keep, um, I think, more people safe um, in work, but equally highlight issues um, when, when they come about in real time, rather than having to wait for something to happen. Um, but, you know, we have um, set up a, a National Health and Safety Forum, which has been gr uh, brilliant. You know, it brings employers, government, enforcement agencies and unions uh, to the table, but there remains a real um, need and focus on translating those structures then um, around discussion and regulation into real life impact for workers on the ground. So, you know, we've continued to raise concerns, for example, about compliance with COVID workplace safety measures um, on the new regulations that were, were brought in um, in January 2021 this year that say that employers must conduct risk assessments. And we have been, um, you know, looking at data on a regular basis. And the most recent data showed that 41% of workers said that their employers had undertaken a risk assessment. And that's only one in four saying that they've been consulted on any assessment. So you can see that there's a, a real sizable gap between what the regulations are trying to do and what is then happening. So we have, at this moment in time, we've got some real concerns. Um, you know, the, the DVLA um, is obviously a central government department, but nonetheless a, a department that, you know, um, exists here in Wales and Swansea. We've had members out on industrial action beginning today over health and safety, over workplace safety, not being taken seriously by employers. And when it comes to the enforcement of regulations, those not actually making a real difference because ultimately and sadly, a member of staff actually has died uh, because of uh, because of COVID and because of the fact that um, we believe that um, the employer was not taking measures seriously. Also, when it comes to social partnership for us, it is about resource. And we have to have, government must be committed to properly resourcing any social partnership structures and associated infrastructure as well. You know, there's, there, we've had some clear issues with other similar projects as well. So for example, when it comes to the Future Generations Commissioner as well, you know, it, it seems to be that the biggest thing that is holding back 
um, you know, them, for example, from being as effective as they could be, because we haven't actually, we've got the legislation, but then we haven't put the, the proper sort of finances and the support structures that are needed behind it then to kind of really give it a push and for it to mean something other than a theoretical nice piece of legislation to have here in Wales. So I think that you know, this again, this legislation, it presents also a big challenge for unions too, and in terms of how we adapt and how we as, as well build our capacity to uh, to make sure that we are maximizing the opportunities um, from this bill as well. I just wanted to kind of um, set uh, a bit of a, a, a give you a quick summary. We have been talking to our affiliated unions. We've been running a, a series of consultations and when it comes to the bill itself and, and why it's required, we broadly accept that the definition of social partnership, but question whether it's realistic to suggest that it can always lead to positive outcomes for all partners. Um, you know, as I explained in the example that I just gave, you know, when the reality is when part of it is seeking to tackle exploitative labor practices, which employers can sometimes benefit from as well. So, you know, that is a bit of a concern for us. We also call for the purpose to be reframed to focus on workers' rights and get in and, and Welsh government's ambition to ensure that everyone can access fair work as well. And we propose a new definition of socially responsible public procurement, which places a greater bit of emphasis on outcomes over processes. And we question why work surrounding the socially responsible public procurement duties has not been taken forward in social partnership as well. And we suggest that, you know, Welsh Government build on the approach that was taken um, in the sourcing steel in major construction infra and infrastructure projects in Wales, combined, which combined the goals of using public spend to deliver fair work and sustain our key industries as well. And on the social partnership duty itself, we welcome the duty and um, but we're not sure that the proposed duty only requiring co requiring consultation with recognized unions and what this means in relation to their mandate or the all the expected areas um, uh, that you know that they will be consulted on. So um, again, we're not shown the need of the principles bit here, but we highlight the importance of public bodies sharing information and consulting at an early stage as possible. On the fair work duty itself as well, you know, we welcome the fair work duty proposal and uh, we are considering whether it should be extended to more public bodies than just Welsh Government. And we propose that the fair work goal should be the fair work commissioner's definition of fair work. And we also highlight uh, wanna, we are going to be looking to highlight several levers such as grant funding and skills policy by which Welsh Government could promote, you know, uh, trade unionism and other fair work measures as well. And as far as the socially responsible public procurement duties themselves are concerned, you know, those duties, we welcome them, uh, although we note that fair work duty doesn't appear in the bill. Um, then the socially responsible procurement bill will equate to the well-being goals only. So we propose two additional socially responsible procurement duties, one being a duty for in-house um, and in-source public services, and another a duty for fair work treatment of workers. And we propose a public sector mechanism to support public duties in relation to contract management obligations and measuring that impact, as well as the low cost um, audit model as well, which involves consultation with unions. And, you know, as far as the Social Partnership Council is concerned, we, you know, we welcome the proposal to establish that tripartite uh, relationship, as we have, we support the objectives of BNC, but we question where, where the mandate should come from. Um, we also highlight that it would not be, you know, appropriate for any sectoral social partnerships like the NHS um, Partnership for them, Forum or the Fair Work Forums recommended by the Fair Work Commission to become subgroups as they would not be able to determine their own membership and arrangements. And then the information advice to ministers could technically um, be overturned by the SPC itself. So there's also a risk here that the subgroups could not be constituted as collective bargaining arrangements, given that we don't think that Welsh Government has the power to legislate on collective bargaining arrangements. And then around supporting improvement and compliance, we're considering now um, the possibilities of uh, the creation of an office which could provide improvement and compliance services um, that recognises that, you know, as I say, with the example that I provided around health and safety, then non-compliance 
is a massive issue, but so is the implementation as well. You know, the, some, a department like this could possibly be headed up by like a social partnership commissioner, um, and it could advise on how public bodies deliver their obligations under the bill as well. Um, in terms of the in compliance approach, we're looking to the commissioner with the strongest powers at the moment, which is the Welsh Language Commissioner who can issue improvement notices and fines. And then this um, could lead to the need for an independent tribunal to take appeals as well. Um, the bill also suggests several areas where Welsh ministers may issue statutory guidance. And we propose that enforcing this sort of statutory guidance should remain with the relevant sector regulator as well. Um, and then finally, around equalities and impacts, um, I think that the, the socioeconomic duty moving to a more equal Wales, you know, as we go through the process of building back um, is a, a real opportunity for us to look at this sort of structure of social partnership. Hopefully this bill will give us that opportunity to keep moving with some of the work that we've seen. You know, over the last couple of days, we, we've seen what's come out of the UK government when it comes to the recognition that apparently racism isn't a, isn't a reality. It's not the lived experience or the stats somehow don't speak for themselves. Here in Wales, we have through social partnership working, working with trade unions, working with government and working with a range of grassroots third sector BME led organisations, we have developed a race equality action plan with anti-racism at the heart of it. And the Welsh government are also looking at the possibilities of setting up a race disparity department. So there's loads of really good things that are happening. But our concern now, of course, is that we've got the Senate election coming up. We've been working with a government that has um, demonstrated a real clear commitment in uh, social partnership in action, in recognizing that workers should have a voice at the, at the table, at those big decision-making tables. And they have made it quite clear what their position is when it comes to equality and inclusion. So, you know, for us, the next stages are gonna be extremely, you know, uh, important as to what comes next as well, and whether we can make this legislation, this piece of really important legislation, something that's gonna be worthwhile for workers. Thank you very much for that, Shav, and I'm sure, uh, well, that will be our aim as well, to make something out of this consultation and legislation that will be there for workers and for trade unions. Thanks for that focus on what the Welsh TUC has been doing to strengthen uh, any future regulations and for reminding us of the gap between what regulations say and the reality of life uh, on, on, uh, in the workplace. Um, whether that's on enforcement or social partnership duties or fair work duties or the extent of coverage. Yeah, thank you for reminding us of all those points and for uh, finishing on an issue of equality as well, most important. Um, I'm going to move swiftly on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Mick Antonew. Um, Mick has been the member of the Welsh Parliament for Pontypridd for the past 10 years. Prior to being elected, he was a partner at Thompson's, um, the trade union solicitors. He has served in the Welsh government as council general and more recently chaired the Legislation, Justice and Constitution Committee. So, Mick, I said in my introduction that you were instrumental in bringing the Institute into the discussion around the Fair Work Agenda. Tell us, are you pleased with how the bill is progressing and how IAR can assist you moving forward? So, over to you, Mick. Well, I think listening to the last two speakers, um, I think we can realise that this is potentially a very radical piece of legislation, but it's a piece of legislation we have to get right and we have to give it teeth, perhaps not make the mistakes of the past with well-intended legislation that we've had. I remember, well, the corporate homicide legislation, full of good intentions, but at the end of the day, a government not prepared to give it teeth. Uh, and uh, this has got to be very, very different. And in the post-COVID world, what could be more important that legislation that actually creates uh, an environment for social partnership on a statutory footing, uh, but also a framework for ethical employment and collective bargaining. And I'm very glad of the work of IER in this area and for the support for this 
bill and your input will be extremely important because this is probably the only piece of radical and progressive legislation in this field that we are likely to see in the UK for the next couple of years. And I hope that what it can become is an exemplar of a boy potential uh, uh, stepping stone for legislation in the rest of the UK with a future uh, alternative government. The um, Welsh government's uh, record in this area, in an area where we don't have the specific uh, devolved responsibilities, I think has been impressive. We did have the, we did of course pass the asbestos bill, which we lost, it was a private member's bill, in fact I pursued what we lost 3-2 in the Supreme Court, uh, but we did pass the Agricultural Wales Act, which established and re, uh, effectively the uh, an agricultural workers uh, rights uh, within the agricultural sector on the basis of our devolved responsibilities for agriculture. We've done it in respect of the Trade Union Wheels Act, in respect of uh, our function uh, for social partnership uh, and how the uh, aspects of the uh, trade union uh, legislation in the UK uh, was actually interfering with our capacity to carry out our public sector duties. In respect of the Social Care and Wellbeing Act, the way we have uh, managed to legislate against zero hours contracts in the care sector uh, by arguing that if you don't have proper training and proper contracts, the quality of delivery of, uh, uh, of care uh, is under undermined. And of course, one of the promises that our First Minister made in his leadership campaign that we would legislate to implement Section 1 of the Equality Act of 2010, that has now been fulfilled and that Section 1 takes effect from the 30, took effect from the 30th of March 2021. Now on top of that, of course, we've had, as, as others have mentioned, the socio-economic, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, sorry, we've had various guidance in respect of procurement, in respect of trade union blacklisting and so on. So we have started to create that framework for a more ethical uh, environment and partnership within Wales to move forward. And what could be more important, as I've said, as we come out of uh, uh, COVID? Of course, the one of the big challenges we have faced in everything we've had to do has been around the issue of uh, competence. And of course, we had the 2006 Government of Wales Act, which uh, provided a conferred model of powers. And that was changed, of course, in 2017 by the Government of Wales Act uh, to a reserved model, which created a, a different set of complicating uh, issues around competence. Uh, but nevertheless, we uh, have established a social partnership council, uh, and it's a model which is based on the Welsh Government's Fair Work uh, agenda and it, it consists basically of the CBI, the FSB, the trade unions and the Welsh Government. Effectively this legislation is about putting that social partnership on a statutory footing and giving it teeth and giving it teeth through the leverage of around eight billion pounds worth of public procurement. And this legislation has, was initiated essentially by the trade unions in Wales, um, the Wales TUC passing legislation, passing motions in support of uh, fair work legislation and the establishment by the Wales TUC of a legal advisory group to prepare the legal groundwork, which I was very proud to to chair and which I hope will be re-established once the, we have the new government in place after the Senate elections. Um, if I just perhaps go on a little bit further, and as I mentioned, the, the, this particular piece of legislation uh, was a commitment by the uh, our now First Minister Mark Drakeford uh, as part of his leadership uh, campaign. Of course, in addition to that, we've had the Fair Work Commission, which is a commission set up by Welsh Government, which reported in March 2019, which again is very worth reading because, again, it provides a lot of information and framework for the establishment of ethical standards of employment. It says, in terms of two key recommendations, the fair work must be seen as a responsibility of Welsh Government ministers and officials. And it gave a definition of fair work. Fair work is where workers are fairly rewarded, heard and represented, secure and able to progress in a healthy, inclusive environment where rights are respected. And it talked also about promoting fair work through economic incentives, through social value and procurement. Now, I believe this bill actually goes further than that, because, as I say, it creates a statutory framework uh, within which that can operate and seeks to give it teeth. Now, you'll notice all 
also that, of course, this bill is work in progress. That is, uh, we had wanted this bill to be fully drafted, uh, to have gone through the full process uh, of enactment by the time of these Senate elections. Unfortunately, COVID and Brexit has decimated part of the legislative agenda uh, in uh, the uh, Assembly, which is now the Senate, the Welsh Parliament. The committee I chair, Legislation, Justice and Constitution, has in fact scrutinised some 800 pieces of legislation in connection with uh, particularly Brexit, but also uh, COVID, and there is much, much more to come. And I can tell you also, we are heading into a battleground post Senate elections in respect of Tory austerity, in respect of constitutional reform, uh, and also legislation such as this. So this social partnership bill seeks to put uh, create a legislative tripartite social partnership consisting of unions, employers and government on an equal footing. It seeks to use procurement as leverage to achieve ethical standards of employment. Basically, if you want public money, then you have to satisfy a socio-economic duty, which is a devolved responsibility of Welsh government. And that also has to apply through contracting, through subcontracting, through sub-subcontracting. And we know the system that as it works to actually get around any of the commitments that are ever given in main contracts. It creates public sector duties, but it also applies to the private sector in terms of the private sector accessing and using uh, uh, public money. It doesn't change employment law or industrial relations, but it is important that it recognises the socio-economic benefit of ethical standards. It, recognize, it must recognise the importance of collective bargaining to achieve these objectives, and it must recognise the importance of trade union representation in achieving these socio-economic objectives. I mention those things very specifically because you gather there are some very significant gaps in the bill going to consultation, uh, which are going to be obviously uh, under intense uh, scrutiny and discussion, I put it as politely as I can, uh, in the next um, uh, uh, well uh, Parliament. Um, the key uh, additional issue is, of course, going to be the issue of monitoring and enforcement. None of this means anything if we're not able to monitor and to actually enforce what happens. And Shivana uh, and Bethano have also commented on that. And those are areas I, I would suggest also need very considerable scrutiny. So the three key issues for consultation for the next Sunnith are having fair work on the face of the bill with a very clear definition and having collective bargaining as one of the key criteria in the evaluation of achievement of socio-economic objectives and also then having an effective monitoring and enforcement regime in my view that goes beyond the issue of naming and shaming that goes further but it may be that this will take time and stages it is as you will gather from the last two speakers an intensely compl complex area, uh, which is why the IER is important and the expertise in this is, I think, extremely valuable and why it is so important that trade unions make their contributions very strongly within the consultation process, because rest assured there will be other interests that will do likewise. So there is a battle ahead on this bill. There will be efforts to water it down, to query competence and to limit monitoring and enforcement. So this is a radical bill. It will push at the boundaries of competence. It could well end up in the Supreme Court. However, as I've said, it is probably the most progressive piece of socio-economic legislation we're likely to see in the UK for the next four years. And as I said, a marker for future UK Labour legislation. So hence, I hope across the UK, trade unions, employment lawyers, academics, Politicians will do all they can to contribute and make this legislation as strong and effective as possible. And I make one recommendation at the end of my contribution, and that is I recommend that the Welsh TUC re-establishes its legal advisory group and that this group should also seek to engage and involve partnership with the IER to advise on the bill and aspects of the development of the bill as it passes and proceeds through its legal stages after the May the 6th elections when we have a new uh, Welsh uh, government. Thank you.
Thanks very much for that. Make a very clear outline of what's in the bill and what isn't in the bill and how we might be able to inform any responses to the consultation. And thank you for the suggestion of the legal advisory group. I'm sure the Institute would do all that it can um, to participate and assist in any way of such a group. I'm going to move swiftly on to our final section which has two speakers, John Hendy and Keith Ewing, who are the chair and president of the Institute of Employment Rights and the authors of a whole stack of IER publications. Not least, they guided the 25 experts involved in our manifesto for labor law and crafted their thoughts into a legally coherent and politically attractive uh, set of policies for a framework of labor law fit for the 21st century. John and Keith will also be drafting the IER's response to the uh, Wales consultation process. Um, so John and Keith, talk us through the highlights and the headlines of what we might be saying, over to you. Well, <clears throat> thanks very much, um, uh, Cad, and thank you to all our speakers for what they've uh, said. Um, I, I have to say we, we take our hats off to those who drafted the Social Partnership and Public Procurement Wales Bill and indeed the other measures which uh, Mick laid out for us. And uh, I think uh, um, we speak with some humility, being very conscious of the constraints uh, operating in Wales, both because of the uh, devolved uh, competencies and the legal limits uh, around them and the areas of controversy indeed around, around them and the, the background political situation, both in the UK generally uh, and in Wales in particular. And speaking for myself, I, I only have a sort of cursory view uh, or understanding of the uh, issues raised in the Social Partnership and Public Procurement uh, Bill. And therefore, um, some of what I'm, I'm about to say may appear to be absolute rubbish and completely irrelevant, but you'll have to put up with that. Um, uh, there's two things really that I, I want, wanted to say. One, one was in relation to public pr the provisions on public procurement and the gap in part two of the bill, in particular in cl clause four, which says in this act, the fair work goal means Wales being a nation where work is characterized by and then there are three blanks for what should follow. So the fair work goal is, has not yet been identified by the drafters. And of course, that's an area clearly to be consulted uh, about. Uh, the obvious things from any employment lawyer's uh, perspective is, is uh, or the issues there, uh, I appreciate that Mick has already given us a definition of uh, fair, fair uh, 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 work, but uh, fr from uh, an outsider's perspective, obviously the things to focus on are a decent income, permanent jobs and the elimination of zero hours contracts and uh, insecure employment in the form of casualization, agency workers and uh, gig status uh, and limb B workers and that sort of thing. And um, in particular, uh, the uh, a requirement for there to be full and proper collective bargaining, including collective bargaining over health and safety, equality, and all the other um, issues. But in relation to those things, in, in relation to identifying either fair work or at least putting forward the arguments in support of the definition of uh, fair work, whatever uh, our colleagues determine it uh, to be, I just wanted to draw attention to the work of the ILO here, the Declaration of Philadelphia in 1944, the Declaration of Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work in 1998, and the Declaration on Social Justice for a Fair Globalization in 2008. Uh, documents which are 
uh, absolutely critical to any labor lawyer and establish the international standards for the entire world and refer, of course, to the fundamental ILO conventions. I also wanted to, to mention as uh, which uh, of, of issues that can be uh, relied upon in support of the definition for fair work the provisions of the European Social Charter, all of which have been, uh, or the relevant ones, have been ratified by the United uh, Kingdom, in, in particular Articles 2 to 6, the, the rights to just conditions of work, the right to safe and healthy working conditions, the right to a fair remuneration sufficient for a decent standard of living for themselves, the workers and their families, and the right of freedom of association in trade unions and the right to bargain uh, collectively. All those things could perhaps inform and be a basis for justifying a definition of, of fair work, which is fair to uh, workers. And finally, if, um, I, I wanted to draw attention to the Social uh, Partnership uh, Council and its emphasis on a, a collective uh, bargaining. Of course, it's not so a collective bargaining in itself, as Shav has pointed out, but it is at least a step on the road to uh, collective bargaining. And I wanted to say in relation to that, that the arguments in favour of collective bar bargaining and union involvement on behalf of workers have been recognised, of course, by the ILO, but also by the Organisation of Economic Cooperation and Development. The OECD publishes a, an employment outlook every year. And if you look at the, the uh, uh, reports for 2016, 17, 18, 19 and 20, all of them have got extensive uh, chapters uh, supporting uh, the restoration of collective bargaining. Even the IMF in 2015 has pointed out the benefits of bargaining a, a, a coll collectively. And the EU itself, which has done so much, I have to say, to damage collective bargaining in Europe, has a provision in its latest draft direction on the establishment of, of national minimum wages to promote a collective uh, bargaining. And the benefits of collective bargaining, of course, are obvious raising of living standards, increasing demand in the economy, preventing undercutting, uh, preventing or diminishing inequality, and of course, ensuring democracy at work. And my final thought is this in relation to the Agriculture Wales Act, which uh, Shav and Mick uh, mentioned, restoring uh, an agricultural wages council or uh, whatever its current name is for Wales, a statutory collectively, collective bargaining body, I wonder whether it's not possible to consider uh, similar legislation in relation to other devolved subject matters. For example, I don't know what the status of social care is, but a, a social care a, um, joint council uh, would be something to repair some of the da damage to uh, workers uh, in that uh, cowboy sector. And there are others, of course, which uh, uh, immediately come to mind. But this may be the product of my ignorance. It may not be possible under the devolved powers. I don't know. So over to Keith. OK, well, thanks, uh, John. and. Um... Thanks very much to the uh, other uh, speakers and to uh, the audience uh, for being here tonight. Um, I just want to start by uh, putting this into some kind of um, bigger context uh, in the sense that you know, this, the, the bill doesn't stand isolated. I mean, it's part of a much bigger picture, I think, outside Wales. And I think Mick mentioned the uh, Brexit uh, and I think Brexit is quite a good uh, a point of departure because, you know, when we were in membership of the EU, uh, we there was a procedure in the uh, EU treaty for what was called social dialogue, whereby uh, trade unions were engaged in a process 
of consultation and uh, legislation making the rules uh, by which uh, workers throughout Europe uh, were, were governed uh, uh, and protected. Now, we've lost that, I think, as a result of Brexit. And I think the Social Partnership Bill uh, reminds us uh, to some extent uh, of some of what we've lost. But on leaving the EU after Brexit, we, uh, the United Kingdom at least, acquired a number of um, uh, obligations under the uh, free trade uh, agreement. Uh, one of the obligations was the obligation on this country, on the United Kingdom, to protect and promote social dialogue on labour matters among workers and employers and their respective organisations uh, with relevant government authorities. Now, why the bill is important is that the bill is the only example of this in the United Kingdom, the only example of any government uh, in the United Kingdom taking these legal obligations post-Brexit uh, at all seriously. But I think you know, if anybody's sceptical uh, or doubtful about the bill, uh, whether it be its legal foundations or its politics, then I think the answer to that is very straightforward, is that this country has legal obligations as a result of Brexit to give effect to measures of this kind, not just in Wales, but throughout the United Kingdom. And my hope would be that the Social Partnership Bill would be a template uh, for the other uh, governments in these islands uh, to follow uh, and uh, to uh, adopt. So I think, I mean, the bill stands on very, very secure uh, foundations, it seems to me, both legally uh, and uh, politically. So just moving on then from that, I mean, just to look at what the bill says, and just for, for, for my own benefit to remind me before I go beyond this, but I think there are four provisions uh, in the bill which uh, stand out uh, to me as I was reading through it. And the first of these is the, the social partnership duty, which is a duty, I think, uh, which applies uh, to public bodies. Uh, I don't see it applying directly to uh, the private sector, though, as Mick said, it may have, there may be indirect uh, applications uh, of this duty. But the first is the social partnership duty. The second, I think, um, uh, very interesting, is the uh, duty uh, on the uh, Welsh ministers to promote uh, fair, fair work and uh, fair work goals as part of the uh, so, uh, sustainable development uh, obligations uh, under the uh, previous legislation of uh, 2015. But uh, as has been explained, the, the legislation uh, has gaps. And I thought when I first read the bill that we got to fill it in ourselves and we got to create our own uh, fair work goals. But then I realised that probably wouldn't be very helpful because we'd all have different uh, fair work goals and the legislation probably couldn't work on that basis. But it's a bit like join the dots, but you make up your own dots and then join them together. But I don't think that that's going to work. So we're going to have to come up with a better uh, definition. So thirdly, then we've got the provisions that we've heard about, which relate to uh, socially responsible uh, public uh, procurement. So I think, uh, which again, uh, strikes me as re being really important and it now mirrors obligations which are now being promoted at European level in the draft directive that John referred to on the minimum wage and collective bargaining, where at EU level, they're now using public procurement as a lever uh, to promote uh, minimum wages and uh, uh, collective bargaining uh, in particular. And then finally, I think a provision which uh, I especially like is the um, Social uh, Partnership Council and why that's important. I mean, quite apart from its practical contribution, the symbolic value of that, I think, cannot be exaggerated. The Social Partnership Council, which draws trade unions and employers into a process with governments uh, as uh, equal partners. And this, I think, is a, is a really, really significant uh, development. Uh, and I think you know, it must be you know, one of the proudest achievements, uh, if implemented, uh, of uh, Welsh devolution, because it does something quite fundamental about, uh, it says something quite fundamental, I think, about the nature of democracy of uh, which Wales is trying to build, the inclusive nature of democracy and the voice which this gives to workers through their trade unions in the processes uh, of government. But so that I think, I mean, you know, in a sense, it seems to me to be, these are all four really important uh, aspects of the bill. Question then is, could the bill be uh, improved? And what are the issues I think that, in a sense, at the Institute, we might uh, want to look at 
in terms of improvement. Uh, if you know, if, if I can be a modest uh, uh, and lack any humility about this, but if we were to have a, a blank check. And the first issue I think is, well, we would maybe look at the social partnership uh, duty and maybe ask, and this, uh, my responses, I guess, may be based on a misunderstanding of the bill, but to the extent of my understanding, and Mick will correct me if I've got it wrong, but the first question I think is why does the social partnership duty which applies only to public bodies, why does it apply only in the context of uh, sustainable development under the previous act of uh, 2015? Why should it not apply to all statutory duties of all uh, public bodies, uh, if it indeed is to apply exclusively uh, uh, in the uh, public sector? So there's one question there about the scope and range of the uh, social partnership duty. The second issue, of course, is that we need to uh, fill in clauses four and five, uh, which means that we've got to define the uh, fair uh, work uh, goals. And I think, you know, that's going to be quite tricky. We've heard from, uh, uh, I think we've heard this evening about the, uh, the recommendations of the Fair Work uh, Commission, which I think it sounds to me uh, 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 as a good uh, starting point uh, for filling in these uh, missing uh, provisions. But I think one thing that struck me about the way in which the bill is drafted at the moment is that the fair work goals uh, relate back to uh, the uh, provisions, the well-being goals in the 2015 Act. And the well-being goals, I think, uh, there are, I think there are about seven of them, but I think the fair work uh, obligation uh, relates directly to at least five of these uh, well-being goals in the sense that it relates to prosperity, it relates to equality, it relates to health, it relates to cohesive communities, and it relates to a globally a responsive uh, Wales. So it seems to me there's a lot there uh, on, you know, th 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 that the fair work duty could uh, hang on to, uh, which the fair work duty could help to uh, promote. And I think it's particularly interesting uh, as I said to Mick at the start, that the, uh, the first of these uh, well-being uh, duties uh, or goals, first of these well-being duties relating to prosperity uh, concludes with the words decent work. Now the word decent work, I think, gives us some context onto which to hang and to have a sense of continuity uh, between the 2015 Act uh, and the uh, current uh, social partnership bill. Uh, and the term decent work, I mean, I think it's probably a term that is used quite loosely and perhaps ill-advisedly, but it is a term which is recognized in international law. Uh, and it's a term which was developed by the International Labour Organization uh, about uh, 20 years ago and has since been adopted by the uh, United Nations. Uh, and as so far as the ILO is concerned, uh, it has been defined to mean broadly four things. And one is access to full uh, and productive employment. Uh, two is rights at work. Three is uh, social protection, which uh, for this purpose means uh, adequate social security. But fourthly, it also means social dialogue uh, and uh, collective bargaining. And the way in which these four principles have been operated, I'm just looking around at some ILO documents in terms of the, 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 the work that the ILO has done to promote, the promotional work it has done uh, to promote these uh, four principles. These four principles are really metamorphosed into what are now 10 principles uh, of uh, decent work. Uh, I won't go through all these uh, 10 principles now, but I think they'll be familiar uh, to all of us. Uh, and they really play to an agenda in which uh, there is a strong sense of uh, obligation uh, to strong levels, high levels of uh, worker protection and strong forms of worker uh, engagement uh, in uh, decision making. Uh, and in a sense, just, uh, and some of it, I think, you know, it goes back to some of the stuff John was talking about, the Declaration of Philadelphia. And one of the great principles of the ILO, which I think would be, would be beautiful to see in the uh, Social Partnership Bill, is the principle in the Declaration of Philadelphia that uh, workers are entitled to a just share of the fruits of progress. Now that is something you know, quite radical. And the idea that we're entitled to a just share of the fruits of progress, which requires us to have some kind of theory of social justice, which would inform 
the content uh, of, of, of this bill and the ideas that would be taken forward uh, through the bill. So that I think, I mean, there's a lot to be done, I think, just working up this uh, critical duty, I think, which seems to me to be the pivotal part uh, of the bill. But basically what we're talking about, I mean, if I was to write this, the sentence in clause four, I would say that this is about reducing social, economic and health inequalities. And that all plays back to 2015 Act by secure and stable employment, high wages with a national minimum wage as a floor and not a ceiling, and with constantly improving working conditions. And then we develop the way by which we do that, which would be through recognizing that labor is not a commodity by ensuring that there is universal and effective labor protection by recognizing uh, social dialogue as the best form of social partnership and recognizing collective bargaining as the best form of uh, social dialogue and that sectoral collective bargaining uh, is the most effective way of promoting uh, collective bargaining overall as the history of these islands uh, conclusively shows. So really, I mean, my sense is that the fair work goals are about promoting equality. Uh, and the best way to promote equality is through high labor standards and high levels of uh, collective bargaining. And that's, I think, what we'd want to see uh, written into uh, clauses uh, four and five of the bill uh, were it to be uh, passed. And then moving on very quickly, sorry for taking up so much time, but very quickly to the third issue, how would we improve it? Well, I think we might want to have a look at the public procurement provisions. Uh, do they go far enough? And uh, one um, issue I would ask is, well, why stop at contracts? Why not include also other forms of state support uh, for businesses which operate in Wales? For example, any licensing function, any grants that are made, any other forms of uh, financial support that are made to business, they should come with conditionality in terms of uh, uh, fair work. And in this respect, I think it's quite interesting to note that in the context of the EU directive, uh, which uh, has been referred to on minimum wages and uh, collective bargaining, uh, that public procurement is being used there too as one of the key instruments. Uh, but the when they're talking about public, public procurement, they're also talking about other concessions. Now, I don't know what that means in European uh, English. I mean, I have no idea what, what, what they have in mind here, but it seems to me that it goes beyond contracts. And it seems to me to invite uh, other forms of uh, state support, uh, which, you know, to which collective bargaining obligations or minimum wage commitment uh, would be uh, tied. And then the second issue on public procurement, I think, is that uh, just looking at the, I think um, uh, Hannah mentioned the, uh, the, the arrangements about uh, social public works clauses. And again, the issue there is it seems to me the social public works clauses as currently drafted do, more than, do no more than expect businesses to comply with the existing law. And if that is the case, I don't see, you know, I think we're missing a trick because the whole purpose of public procurement is to expand uh, statutory or other legal obligations by imposing other socially desirable ends on the enterprises in question. And this would be, it seems to me, to be the opportunity uh, to start uh, looking at uh, collective bargaining, obligation to comply with collective agreements or to participate in various forms uh, of uh, social dialogue as a condition uh, of these various uh, benefits which the state uh, might uh, provide. And then the third issue on public procurement, I think uh, it may be implicit, but it seems to me that it would be important to have some kind of uh, independent uh, monitoring uh, uh, system whereby social partners could make complaints to an independent body that a contractor was not complying uh, with, uh, with obligations under the terms of these uh, contracts. Contracts are going to be published after all, so they're going to be in the public domain. And it seems to me that it ought to be possible for a to have a complaints-driven system to an independent agency, which would enhance uh, the transparency uh, of, the, uh, of the procedures and the transparency of the obligations under these uh, procedures. Now, at the moment, I think a complaint, uh, at the moment, issues can be raised by the Welsh ministers. But the Welsh ministers may choose for whatever reasons that they don't want to do that, or decide they don't want to do that for whatever reasons. It'd be much better, I think, if there was to be some kind of independent 
uh, process to which uh, these masters could be uh, referred. And then the, uh, and considered, and then published, so that, uh, you know, since we, we, have, we have much more visibility and transparency uh, around these issues. And then the fourth issue, I think, is on uh, so the Social Partnership Council. I think, um, I think, as I said, I think it's one of the real jewels in the crown uh, of uh, democracy, uh, you know, throughout uh, these islands, uh, if this comes off. Uh, but I think, why, why not uh, extend its jurisdiction? Why restrain the jurisdiction of this uh, council to the matters uh, currently proposed, which are around uh, fair work and sustainable development? Why not extend it to include all macroeconomic decision making and all macroeconomic uh, activity? Now that would be, I mean, that would be real democracy. That would be real social democracy in action. And here is the opportunity to to do that in a sense for Wales to become the real social democracy uh, of uh, of these of these islands. So that's my sense and sense and sense. And just to sum up, we've got in a sense we see this in the context. Or certainly, I see this in the context of of uh, you know, sense of a much bigger uh, global picture. I mean, it's a huge contribution to uh, workers' rights uh, and uh, democracy uh, on a, you know, at a global level. I think we just cannot exaggerate how important this is. Secondly, it does this in these four uh, different ways, which I've tried to outline, but I think you know, it would be possible to go further and uh, to, to make this even stronger. Uh, to build build even higher and to have even greater ambitions than the ambitions which are reflected in the bill itself. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you both to John and to Keith um, for those very interesting points. Um, you've given us the legal insight, you've reminded us about international laws and how they fit and you've discussed how we might fill the many gaps in the current uh, draft of the bill. Uh, as I said at the beginning, the deadline for the consultation is the 23rd of April. Uh, an IER submission to that uh, will be made public once it is drafted. It will be available on our website. Um, in the chat box, there are a whole load of links to uh, relevant international um, laws and regulations that have been that that, that John spoke about. Uh, there has been a question raised saying that you cannot, as delegates, save our chat box, but they will be circulated um, following this event. Uh, the um, the panelists have been very busy while we've been speaking, answering questions that have been placed in the chat box. I'm assuming that everybody can read those. Um, they should be on the top of your question and answer. Uh, links. Um, most of them, well, all of them have been answered. Um, we're nearing actually the end of it. So given that the questions have all been answered, I wonder if our panellists want to add any comment based on the questions that have been raised or on any of the points that were raised by John and Keith. Shall we um, go into that? Oh, Mick's quick to get his hand up there, so Mick, over to you. I just want to make a couple of what I thought were really important points that have been made by, um, uh, by John, by uh, Keith uh, in particular. Firstly, in terms of the ILO, absolutely right. There are some, I mean, we have an obligation uh, as a Welsh Parliament to, to not to breach or to uh, discomply with uh, international uh, obligations. Uh, and uh, I think those are very important factors. And that's why actually also things like Section 1 of the Equality Act was important because it re-emphasizes that socio-economic duty. Um, he raised also the issue as to why not apply to all duties of public sector bodies. And I agree absolutely entirely. This is something that could apply across the board. And in actual fact, in letters from our employment minister to companies during the COVID funding, uh, it has actually been done. And we've been attacked uh, during that period by the Conservatives, claiming uh, you have to be a member of a trade union or recognise a trade union in order to qualify for Welsh government money. Well, that actually wasn't correct. But the sentiment is 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 actually there in terms of the the ethical objective, and in terms of the well-being of future generations act that's referred to in the reference to decent work, I mean it's interesting. We we had a real battle on that. I mean in the early days of the bill, 
uh, we're putting very strong recommendations that fair work should actually be included. Um, I don't know quite how those negotiations uh, subsequently went in the development of the bill, because uh, after a certain period of time, I found myself excluded from those discussions. And I think the best that managed to come back in was decent work. But as you say, it is, uh, it, 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 it is a, a, a lever that's there. Uh, and uh, I, what I really do hope is that on, the, on what is going to be put in by the uh, IER, I think all those things that have been suggested, I think, are very important areas. And to reply to, um, uh, to John, who says, well, there's a, there's a gap there and uh, we just fill it in. Well, in actual fact, that is absolutely right. Uh, I think it's yes. I mean, clear ideas in terms of what that should be. If we were drafting, if IER was drafting this legislation, etc., if the trade unions were drafting it, what would they want to actually actually go in there within the context of this bill, competence and everything else. Uh, so those are absolutely uh, important. And the one final point I make is this uh, independent monitoring. Uh, I, I think that's an excellent idea. I know it was discussed. I know there have been lots of arguments around it. This is uh, another area to obviously be discussed, but any recommendations in on that I think are important because for me, at the end of the day, the proof of the pudding is, as they say, in the eating. And if you don't know what is happening and you don't have a mechanism for redress on the application of those standards, uh, then the legislation lacks the teeth that it actually needs. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, me. Um, Hannah, is there anything that you would like to add? Thanks, really all I'd like to add at this point is that I think, you know, I very much enjoyed and welcomed the discussion tonight, particularly the contributions from, from, from Lord John Hendy and from, from Professor Keith Ewing, and I look forward to seeing the IER's um, contribution to the consultation, because I think, you know, I think all partners who've been involved with this process have always been clear this is, you know, this is a significant piece of legislation, but it's a step in the direction that we want to need to go in. And actually, you know, it's, a, you know, I think if several people said how this draft bill is a working process, and I think this evening's event has been really, really important in terms of actually how we shape not just the discussion, but the content of, um, of you know, any bill in the future. So I, I say that with the caveat of, um, I think Shav touched on, the, you know, the, the nervous thing about the, the Senate elections ahead, which, um, uh, which I, I myself and Mick are very conscious of. Um, so, you know, I think it's, you know, it, 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 tonight's discussion has been really, really valuable. And I really, you know, just reiterate my thanks for, for you hosting it. You're more than welcome. It's great to have had you here tonight. And Shav, I know you've been very busy throughout um, answering questions in the question box. So it's wonder you've had any opportunity to listen to the presentations, but do you have anything to add, Shav? I have, and uh, I'm, I'm really glad uh, both uh, for the last two contributions because We've been uh, at times it feels like you're stuck between a rock and a hard place where you want to be really bullshy, right? And just kind of tell it as it is. And then you kind of got to think, well, ultimately, we're here representing the views of a range of different unions that have, you know, their own sort of slight takes on everything. But the one thing that we've had back consistently from everyone is very much around the need for an independent sort of monitoring compliance element to all of this. And, you know, let's just look up where we are today with all the workplace outbreaks that have taken place. There's been hundreds of complaints made, yet not one employer has been taken to task, right? So, it, and this ultimately comes back down to the fact that you have got an organization, an enforcement agency like the HSC, but because of the fact that their resources were cut back and now, you know, they've been given more resources, but ultimately a lot of those services are being provided through private contractors. Many of those people don't even have the experience of knowledge of what it means to apply that legislation and that enforcement in practice. So whatever we do going forward, you know, for, for me, what's really important is that we put our money where our mouth is as well, that this means something to ordinary people, whether you're a public sector worker, private sector worker, you work for yourself, regardless of who you are, you, you know, you've got to be in a position where somehow you benefit from, from this piece of legislation. But ultimately, you know, there's limits of how far we can take this. We need to change a government at a UK level as well. Here, here. 
Uh, I think we can all agree with that one. Um, and you're right about health and safety. That's a recent project that we have been doing. It's very interesting to see that the ILO are now thinking of changing their proposals to make occupational health and safety a fundamental right at work. And hopefully that will get through at the June conference uh, this year. If not, then at the maximum the year after. Now, talking about timeframes, there is a question there that says a timeframe would be useful. I've said that the consultation closes on the 23rd of April. Do we know any other kind of timescale after that? Or do we just have to await the result of the election? Hannah? Well, the result of the election is probably quite significant in terms of, of, of taking it forward. <laughs> um, but should the result of the election, or should a, a Labour government, Walsh Labour government be returned after the Senate elections in May, the ambition is for to legislate for this in the first year of the next Senate term? Mashin? Mick, did you want to say something or are you just agreeing with no, that? No, I was just going to say, I mean, it is it is gone as far as it can within the time scale, the capacity that we had left before the elections. And we didn't want to lose at least having this marker down. But it'll be the next, uh, the sixth uh, Welsh Parliament uh, that will have the responsibility now of taking this forward. And that's why, you know, I made that point uh, as some sort of a partnership between Wales TUC and IER on supporting and seeing through what is intensely complex but also very politically controversial legislation would be, I think, a major asset to those of us who want to see this bill not only succeed but have real teeth as well. Thank you for that, Mick. So, um... Unless anyone's got any other burning comments, I think we are due to finish at quarter past eight, so we're now running a tiny bit late. Uh, I will say again that the Institute's submission will be available as soon as it is completed and drafted and completed. It will be circulated. Can I say a very big thank you to all of our speakers tonight, to Mick, to Hannah, to Shav, to John and yeah. to Keith um, for talking us through this very important process. We wish you well. Um, in the next month and hope that what comes out the other end is an excellent piece of legislation that we can all hold up as a beacon of what can be achieved. So thank you for putting in the way for, for getting us here uh, and good luck with it in the future. Um, there will be for anyone in the room who hasn't who doesn't know about the institute please sign up to our newsletter that will keep you informed of this events like this and uh, and, and and other publications that we are doing all the information will be on the screen at the end there you go um our next event is also listed there Although we have a big event on May Day, so if you're available on May Day, uh, we will have a Zoom meeting at 11 till 12.30 on May Day with a whole host of trade unions, trade unionists um, and uh, academics and politicians in saying what we want to see from the, uh, for the world of work going forward. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you for joining us, delegates, and we look forward to seeing you again in the future.